And so I'm in this great series, and, uh, and it's, it's about us working out our kind of calling and purpose. And today I'm talking about engaging in our city. So I just want to do a quick audit uh, this morning to, to see how many of you were born in Johannesburg. Raise your hands. Wow. You guys, we love you guys. Stay with us. Stay here. You are a rare breed. You are the salt of the earth. You are the amazing people. And we just want to snuggle. If you sitting next to them, just rub your shoulder a little bit closer and just get some of that Joburgness in us, baby. So how many of you kind of lived outside of Joburg and it was your passion and desire for all of your life to come and live in this great city and serve it? <laughs> Amen, sister. I see that one hand. Any others? Any others? Sorry, can't see it. How many of you came to Johannesburg kicking and screaming? No, 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 don't answer. Don't want to see that. Let me ask that same question another way. How many of you followed your spouse or got a great job yourself in this great city? Raise your hands. All right, there's a marriage course happening during the week. You can feel free to contact... Uh, Reagan and Mitre, just as you work through the implications of that. But just by the laughter and the joy that I can feel in here, Joburg has a mixed emotion. Joburg is a, is a city that is, creates, um, even as I left, you know, just such mystery and wonder. Why Joburg was the question from my in-laws and family. Are you sure? Of course it's Joburg, baby. This is the city we find ourselves. And if we look through the verse that we're going to read today, I just want you to listen as Travis reads it to us and, uh, and kind of get it, because there's something big at work uh, as God calls us, not only to the city, but into plans and purposes that he has for us. So Travis, just give us this verse. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 through 33. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. So there's a real power uh, in this couple of verses, and I know as I take off my shirt and reveal this beautiful shirt of uh, the pirates, thank you, uh, we're not, yeah, the glamour boys over there uh, are all good, but we, we live in a city which is, and we work in a city, I've got my safety boots on, my fireproof pants, um, I'm, I'm ready for action for what we do in the city, but there's something in the city that is so much more than just what I do and who I am in there, and this passage brings it out, because it says here, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, and so there's this real kind of moment where it's, it's kind of whatever you do, so it's not necessarily just about what you do, but it's more about how you do it as it starts to unpack this. And that's, that's an amazing thing. If we look at Scripture and you, you dive into some of these, we've got Job, very wealthy businessman. But what do we know him for? It was more about how he lived his life. You've got Jacob, who was a shepherd. We don't really talk about his sheep herding days. You've got David. We get to hear a little bit more about his sheep herding days, but we don't really dive into the technicalities of that or his military or his governance kind of abilities. But what we miss sometimes is the bump and the grind of being a shepherd, the basic trainings of what it means to be in the military and the fitness that it's required to do hand-to-hand -hand combat and the disciplines that needed to be rolled out to make him into those kind of people or persons to, to, to do that. And we forget that. Peter was a fisherman. Paul was a tent maker. And that was his skill set that he had. Jesus was a carpenter for 30 years. We don't talk about his carpentry days and his butt joins and uh, the kind of mechanisms and the technicalities of, of what carpentry was. But for 30 years, I'm rocking on to 30 years in the business world or in industry and working. It's a long time to be in there. I've, you know, I've lost hair and put on a few pounds and, and I'm working through that. But God has so much more for us than just our vocation in it. And it's, it's one of those Amazing things that God could do something in us, regardless of our vocation or the job that we do, He can do more than we imagine. And I think we can be more than just shepherds. 
We can be more than just a beautician or a plumber. We can be more than a CEO or a housewife or an engineer or a sales guy. God can do so much more than just the vocation. I'm not saying the vocation is lesser in any extent, but I've got to say we've got to open our eyes to not just what we're busy with, but the potential and, the, and, and imagine what it is that God could be doing through us, through this vocation that he's got us in this morning. And so you would say, well, how is that even possible? I barely got a matric, and thereafter it was a bit of a hit and miss of how it all unfolded to get me to where I am today. And I would say to you, it is because you are made in the image of God. Genesis says that. You are made in His image, which means you are image bearers, which means you live out His image for God's glory. And that's exactly what this passage is saying to us, is that we live out for His glory. It says, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it for God's glory. You are image bearers, each and every one of you, no matter what your vocation is, of the one true living God. And so that's your identity. That's who you are. And so we get to live out this image. You get to be God's image wherever you go and whatever you do in and amongst the city. Now that, I'm stretching your imaginations. I can see by the glazed look, particularly on the front row uh, and a little bit further back because I can't see any further back uh, in that. And it's, it's this amazing thing, living for God's glory. And glory is like one of those old school words, like kingdom. You know, we don't talk much about the queen and her kingdom. We don't talk about the 10 kings and the one queen that South Africa has within her context uh, and, and what it looks like. It's not something that's naturally in our conversations, but they are there. In fact, your reference to a kingdom would probably be from Braveheart or one of those classic movies of combat and all the rest. But Jesus uses this word kingdom and description of kingdom with great effect. The scenario here is that he's leading or he's ministering and there's this massive crowd that are following and they caught up in the glamour and the glitz of what Jesus is doing, raising the dead, healing the sick and his really controversial teachings is incredibly attractive and the crowds come. But he wants to make a point to them what it costs to follow him, what it costs to have what he has, what it costs um, for them to follow him truly, not just to see the spectacles and while it's comfortable, but what does it mean? And so he does this, he, he speaks, he says, he speaks to them and he says this, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider if he is able with the 10,000 men that he has to oppose the coming king against him with the 20,000? If he is able, if he is not able to, will he not send out a delegation while he's still far off? That's a good idea. Do it while he's far off and then talk terms of peace. And then Jesus says this, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. It's radical talk coming from Jesus himself in this regard. And when I touched on this passage a couple of months back in our CBR, which is just our daily reading kind of pattern, and and we have to journal through these things. As I started to write about this passage, this particular part of it, these verses stood out to me as I kind of considered my kingdom. I am King AJ. I have one loyal subject and three not-so-loyal subjects. (laughs) I got two dogs, a house, and a mom, and a lovely Priscilla who are just in and amongst, but that's my kingdom. I rule and reign in this kingdom. This is mine most of the time when she says it can be. And I, and I live there. But as I consider this kingdom, as I consider AJ and my kingdom coming to war with the other king, and I consider who Jesus is, and I consider his kingdom, his angel armies, it's a little bit like that two against two million. And boy, did we nail those two. It's about that kind of situation where we come up against the God who is so great. And we come with our terms of peace. We come with our surrender as as we approach God, realizing that there's no hope of standing up against His judgment, against His forces, against His plan and His purpose. And we bow our knee before Him. This is the moment of the gospel truth as we come to this King and we surrender to Him. 
Now, normally in, in those kind of times, the king gets obliterated or chopped into pieces and left all around the city as an example, and the rest of the people get made to be slaves of this kingdom. But not King Jesus. He raises me up, puts a ring on my finger, puts a robe on my shoulders, and welcomes me in to his kingdom. Not the petty five-man band with a dodgy, broken, fallen-down house and a very dodgy economics. We're talking mighty king, incredible resources, incredible strength of economy and scale and defense. Uh, there's infrastructure. There's all kinds of magnificent things that roll in this kingdom that I have just been welcomed into. One that I've just been made a son of this incredible kingdom. And sometimes we take this vast kingdom that we've been brought into as we've surrendered our lives. And we, we kind of want to, in our narrow-minded and our kind of small view that we have, we want to condense all of this majesty and magnificence of God's kingdom into three little tick boxes. And we say, if I go to church, tick, that's what it means to be part of this kingdom. If I, what else? Yes. Uh, if I go to a midweek service as many times as I can, uh, I'll be part of this kingdom. Tick, one more. Come on, three is a good number. Uh, what is it? Uh, okay, if they ask, I'll give. I'll put giving on my list. And we take the magnificence of this kingdom, the splendor, the glory, the economy of it, the prestige of being part of this man's kingdom, the king's seal himself, and we condense it into three things. And we just tick those boxes and we think we're part of this kingdom. It seems ludicrous. And I don't want to diminish coming to church midweek meetings because, and even giving because every fantastic, powerful, enthusiastic Christian does these things. That's how we roll it out. But they are not what Christianity is. It's not what Christianity makes us. We're sons of the living king. We live in an expansive kingdom. We live in the good of that and that is what we need to lift our gaze to. That's what we need to aspire to. Not three ticks boxes. And once we've ticked those, we get on with our life in between. It's all of life. We live in the economy to see that economy grow. And for the good of the king that we now serve. And Jesus knows how we are so fickle as human beings to kind of uh, get distracted by shiny things. Because the next two verses just talk about that. He says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's not fit for the soil, and it's not fit for the manure pile. It gets thrown out. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And so there's this, this illustration of salt in it, is this illustration of purpose. What is it that we have to do? We need to be salty. And when you lose your salt, like what else? What is the purpose? Where, where would you go? What is it good for? Nothing. So there's a purpose. He's underlying that, yes, this and surrender and everything else, but there's a saltiness that comes. There's a purpose of living in this kingdom. It's not tick boxes because then you're losing the purpose. You're just going through the motions. It's more than that. The gospel of Jesus Christ is like no other. Being and surrendering and being conquered by the gospel of Jesus brings life and brings purpose. One of these amazing things is just this kind of sense of what our Christianity is, just the, the way that we process that. And I think sometimes when we talk about the tick boxes and we, and we kind of think of our Christianity, it's a little bit like buying a lotto ticket. And you just go in prayerfully, of course. You know, that's how we Christians buy lotto tickets. We prayerfully select 10 digits. You hand them carefully to the lady, and then you take that receipt, and you carefully put it in your wallet, and you wait with anticipation for Saturday, and you get on with life and everything else. Saturday comes, you sit down, and you sit there, and they read out these incredible numbers, and you stand up, and you go, I have won nothing. God, how can you do this to me? I prayerfully selected those numbers. I carefully put it in my wallet. I spent 10 rand on that ticket. And the cost of this is not really so much for us. The cost of it was 10 rand. You nearly forgot about the ticket in your wallet. And it's the next time you go, you don't even prayerfully take the 10 numbers. Quick pick, please. And you take that number, you throw it in the cubby out of the car, and you storm off. And the, the attitude, the heart of it is, God, you didn't deliver. I was going to give you some of that money. 
after I bought whatever I needed and did it. I was. I really was. That kind of Christianity as opposed to living in the kingdom where it's one of those James Bond movies and you slide all the chips that you have in this poker game to the center of the table. And more than that, you throw in the house, the kids, their university fees. No wonder you put your Eastern Cape property into that pile, the, the beach house, the caravan, the lot. And horror of all horrors, you take your wife's engagement ring and you put it on the top. And you say, I am all in. Now, right now, the elders are thinking, AJ, you've pushed the boat out a little far. Poker games is not the illustrations we want. But I want to say, wait, elders, you haven't heard the end of the illustration. The joy of this is you're not the one holding the cards. Jesus is. You're not the one making the, playing the game, and it's not yours to do. You're backing Jesus in this. You're slipping everything to the middle of the table on who Jesus is and what he has done. And you live a life like that. And so there's this contrast between the tatama chance, tatama millions, and the living with all in, everything. If it goes south, everything goes south. There's no way that we can get away with it, nothing else that we can do. And our backing is on Jesus. And Jesus kind of almost explains this or allures to it in a couple of his interactions with people. Mark 10 says this, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. It's amazing. You know something wrong is coming when Jesus looks at you and he loves you because you know something else is coming. And he says, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And so Jesus is always kind of calling us out. Uh, on our, where our heart is and what we truly worship. And he can just say one or two things, and you're like, no, don't say that. It's mine. It's mine. I'm holding on to that. And then gently he'll remind us of the kingdom, our surrender, the new kingdom that we fall in, the massiveness of that economy and everything else. But even as I say it, I realize I've had challenges and I have challenges living in the sacred and the secular. You know, there's the hallelujah and the worship that we have, these meaningful moments encountering God. And Monday, I'm dealing with customers and I've got a boss and I've got these other things. And, it's, and they just seem like worlds apart. And I struggle to tie those things together at times. But the thing that pulls all of that together is purpose. What are we made for? What is it that God wants to do in us? They aren't separate. It's just the way we're viewing things in our departmental kind of way. But our purpose brings that all together. God has made us in his image. And we need to be image bearers as we go through both of these things. But where we live and what we work at, that's where God wants his image to be portrayed. And so this topic of purpose is something that's kind of grabbed my imagination from, I was about to say when I was young, but earlier years, let's call it. The youth and now, is, it feels far away. But in my earlier days, I was really pursuing this. It was something that I took life group. I was like, what is your purpose? Do we understand that? What do you think it is? What are your plans for God? And I asked so many questions. I was like, oh, I got a book for you. Here it is. It's Rick Warren. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. Please read it. And then you come talk to me because all your questions are wasting our life group time. And so with great enthusiasm, I went home. I sat on the side of my bed and I turned, opened the book, skipped through the forward. Who cares what other people think? This is my purpose. I want to know what that one thing is that God has got for me. And I'm going to do that because this is going to be it. And it's going to be amazing. And I opened up chapter one. And with great excitement, I read the opening lines. And you know what they are? It says this, it is not about you. You know, cricketers, it's, a, it's an incredible thing. They stay in the changing room and the opening batsman, he has to put on those clunky pads, walks funny. Then you put the box in and you walk even funnier. You go all the way down the stairs, across the grass. You stand in the middle. You ask for center wicket. Your umpire gives it to you. You mark it up. You stand ready. The bowler lines up. The crowds get ready. The commentators are paused. And the first ball comes at you. And you do this amazing just block to get in and punk. All the wickets are gone. It smashed your bowled out. That was it. I was out for a duck. I didn't even get to the second line. I closed the book. I was offended. How can the purpose not be about me? What does Rick Warren know anyway? 
into the cupboard, and I promise you I haven't read it, but those words, it's not about you. <laughs> Told you I'm going to give you the truth from the front here. I'm still coming to terms with Rick Warren and the brutalness of his opening words, but I think I got the very essence of it. It's not about you. It's not about us. And it, the, the fact that it was so offensive to me was actually just God moment of bringing it because I was so amped. And my vision and imagination of what my purposes were was something which was AJ glorifying. The kingdom of five was just amazing. It was like the famous five. But the reality is of what the purposes are that God has built us for and DNA'd us to do is not about me. It's not about you. And you say, well, how can this possibly be? Here's a passage that maybe you haven't seen in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, it just says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Just amazing how we can sometimes, I, I, I have the right to do this. It's mine. I can do it. But it's not always beneficial or constructive in that. And in fact, it goes on to say, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Again, asking us to open our hand, not grip these things so tight that it's mine. I have the right to do this. The walk with Christ is very much open-handed, very much in that kind of space. And so even the passage today, if we read on, and not just, you know, God glorifying, but it says, do not cause anyone to stumble. Again, it's not about you. Don't you do anything that causes somebody else to stumble. Whether Jews, Greeks, or in the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Again, just asking us to look outside of ourselves, asking us to consider others around us. Chris Williamson did a fantastic preach last week, and he, one of his slides was particularly telling, just as it looked at the kind of three areas of exploitation or ethics, and then he talked into re, like this redemptive kind of living, that we live and we're making things new as, 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 as we go about our lives. We're restoring things but making it new. And that's one of the, the natures of God and establishing God's kingdom is that we renew things and that we bring life into these things. And it's a selfless way of, of living. Redemptive living is I give and we win. There's an investment that comes from us uh, in living this redemptive renewal kind of life in and amongst our city. And you'll even see that our mission statement as a church is we want to be renewing Joburg through the gospel because we, we believe that as a church, that as we get about and find our purposes and we live our lives out in that city, we're going to start to see renewal and, and places being kind of redeemed and made as they were. And Jesus lived a life like that. He was the one that kind of uh, healed the crippled and helped them to walk. He was the one that gave uh, uh, sight to the blind and, and hearing to the deaf. He was the one that kind of took lepers and their, and their skin and he gave them new skin and, and, and healed them of disease. He was renewing all the time, restoring relationships with the lady at the well, just speaking into those needs and, and renewing people through and through. And so we can see it in all the testimonies of who God is and what he does, this renewal pattern. Is, un, is, is, is at work. Even the Lord's prayer says, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. There's just this, this calling down, this continual inviting in of God to let his will be done here as we see things done. So if I can have a quick recap, I know that some of you are thinking, so AJ, can I just ask for clarity's sake, you're saying that we all have a purpose within God. And I'd say, yes, well done. You've, you've got the first part. Thank you uh, for getting that. And you would say, well, then secondly, we've got a purpose, but that purpose is not about me. I'd say, yes, two brownie points. You've got that right. And you say, AJ, so I've got a purpose. It's not about me. And it's actually even bigger than that because we now got to start living that out in the, in the city and things will start to become new around us. And I would say, 
three golden stars for you. Pick up your coffee at DC on the way out. Good job. And, and I know that as we think that, right now there's a couple of Eeyores in the cloud, and there's that little dark cloud that follows Eeyore everywhere he goes with thunder, and it rains on him, and he's always sad and somber. But before your cloud catches up with you this morning, I want to ask you to use your gospel imagination. Because as we talk around purpose and those things, we've got to remember this is the kingdom of God. This is his economy. This is his plan, his purposes. And I want you to think along those lines. And I want you to see the kind of newness and the hope, the joy of hope, if all South Africans or if the Joburg South Africans could reverse this unemployment and we start to see a change in the tide there, what hope that brings to us. Or the joy of all South Africans having a solid education. Or even just the hope that comes when a community works hard for one another. Or where the joy of such generosity amongst us that no one is in need. You know, if you just apply your imagination to what those things could look like, how we could be involved in making those things a reality, that God's plans and purposes within us would live out and work out so that those would be true, how much joy and hope and peace would come to our city. And the living of that as God renews through his kingdom, as he renews through us working out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know if you're struggling to get this, if you're struggling to kind of, I can't imagine any of those things happening. I can't see it. It's just a, a little bit distant for me. I would say check out God's credentials. Have a look. Just apply your mind, your energy, and your thoughts just to the credentials. Here's one. One Colossians, or Colossians 1, and it's starting around 8, somewhere around. And it says here, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit uh, for every good work and growing in the knowledge, being strengthened in all the power according to his glorious might, so that you may be uh, may have great endurance and patience, giving joy and thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom uh, of light. And just this incredible inheritance that we have, this God who is kind of investing in us, giving us endurance and patience to work things out, to see the good of others in this great city and what it takes to do that. And so you're going to ask the question, AJ, how, how do I do that? What do I need to do will be your question. And you know what? Funny enough, somebody asked Jesus that very question. What do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? That was the question he got asked. And because he was a law expert, Jesus said to him, so what do you think? And then he says this. He says, well, you know, if you have to ask me, this is what I would say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, do that. You're on it. That's exactly what you need to do. And then feeling a little off, put off, he asks the question, well, then who's my neighbor? You know, to try and catch Jesus and take the deflection off him. And Jesus goes into the story of the Good Samaritan, which we've heard a number of times in kids' church, uh, and, and it's a story that many of us have grown up with. But in essence, there's kind of th three people past this body <laughs> on the side of the road, and it's like London Road in Joburg, baby. It's, it's, it's rough town, rough side of town. And, and it's not healthy and good to stop there. The other people are all religious leaders and, and kind of people of prominence. They walk by, but there's a Samaritan who's the lowest form of human being in the Jewish kingdom and the people that Jesus is talking about. And he takes the time to stop on London Road, uh, risking his own life to help this guy. Takes him off, you know, to Santon, puts him up in the, in the Michelangelo, pays all the bills there for him to be restored and tells uh, the innkeeper, listen, whatever he needs, give it to him. I'll pay you when I come back. And Jesus asks the question, so, sir, out of all the story that I've just told, who do you think is this man's neighbor? Who do you think he'll say? And wisely, the legal guy says, listen, the guy that had mercy on the traveler that was mugged is his neighbor. And Jesus says, exactly. 
In fact, his words are, go and do likewise. There's this instruction to actually go and help those in need. Go and do this. Love your neighbor as yourself in this. And now as we go around Joburg, you can't live a day in Johannesburg without touching other people's lives. It's impossible. You can try it. We can talk next week. But you can't leave the front door without touching somebody, without being approached by a car guard, without touching a teller or picking up the phone uh, or speaking to somebody. You, you're, you're in it, and you're moving through Johannesburg all the time. And just like a, a boat driving through a marina leaves a wake, and all the boats in the marina have to respond to this wake of coming through, we leave a wake in our day. For better or for worse, we leave a wake in our day. And it's just amazing. I mean, in my world, uh, you know, things that are creating a wake, I had a smash and grab incident last week, and I got to meet the staff at Santon Police Station and then had to wait in a long queue at Germiston Police Station to get my case number. There, you're just meeting people in the queue, asking to borrow your pen or your clipboard and, and having conversations with Solly, who's getting an affidavit for this, and Mary, who was coming to get her um, kind of uh, certification, whatever you call it, on her matric certificate so that she could apply and get those things in. And as I was standing in this long queue, there were all these chairs, and it filled up with all the sergeants and the senior people of Germiston Police Station, and it was... Uh, a gender-based violence campaign which they were launching. So all their sponsors were there uh, and everything else. And lo and behold, a lady stands up and she preaches at them about if God doesn't build the house, then you labor in vain. And she opens with this fiery prayer, commissioning the police and everybody else. And they thank her for that. And, they, and she sits down and they go on with it as I'm working my way through the queue to the front and meeting those people. But the conversations that we have, the interactions that we did on our day-to-day -day basis, these are the moments of Johannesburg. There's even a great billboard on the M1 as you go down. I, I drive down to Vitz every day, and I, on the side there, there's, it says, One God. And it's this Muslim campaign that they've put up. And it, I love the view of this, One God with a hand pointing up. And it's, it, it lists all the prophets that we know. And Jesus' name is there and Muhammad's name is on there. But it's, it's people engaging. The, the Muslims engaging our city with what they believe. But that poster has been a great conversation point for me. When I go down south to some of my suppliers and, and they are Muslims and we talk about the sign that's got one God. Can you believe it? And, and we start finding this common ground and having these discussions and I hear their story. What an inroad for us to, to just being in and amongst in one another's lives. The city of Joburg is a city of neighbors. We live wall to wall and close. And so as this illustration of what Jesus says, it's about neighboring one another in many ways. And so the man's question when he started off this comment is, what must I do? And his response was, we need to love God with everything that we've got. And we need to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. I don't know about you, but there's nobody that loves me like I love me. And it's this essence of love that we need to have on, on those two levels of just loving God with everything that we've got, including your minds, people. It's, it's in that list of things, but there's this love that comes through. And I know that love for some of you is this Cupid thing, which happens on February the 14th. There's a plump guy with an arrow, and there's a lady with a harp, or whatever it is that you have, but that's not the kind of love that we're talking about here. We're talking about the love that came so much so for us that God gave His only Son, that kind of love that we receive from God. In fact, 2 Timothy goes here, <clears throat> for the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Isn't it amazing? The Lord, you say, greater love has no one than to lay down one's life for your friends. Amazing provocations of this love. In Romans, it says, Lord, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're talking about a love that is so powerful that nothing can describe it, nothing can touch it, that works in us, on us, 
and through us into this great city. And then in Romans, there's this prayer. It just says, Lord, help me to be, sorry, to help me devote, sorry, help me to be devoted to one another in love, honor, and honor one another. So devoted in love and honor one another above myself. And so there's these heart cries, Lord, let me, let me live that kind of love. Let me live out beyond myself and those things. And so I want to finish off this preach now just with a couple of thoughts. Um, and these are really just the positioning that I've, that I've got that, that have stirred me uh, specifically. And they come from a book which is called The Real-Time Connections. It's Bob Roberts. And it's really, he wants to draw this parallel between a social contract versus a social covenant. And he's really defining the two. One is just this, and, and we'll, you'll see it, but, but the letter of the law, this contract that we have, which is very much around my rights and who I am, around covenant, like a marriage, where you're all in regardless of what it is, and that you're all in to make it better, to all in to make it work, and you're committed. That's a covenant that we have. And so he says, or well, there's a couple of quotes here, and he says that we as South Africans, we need to abandon the, the kind of concept of entitlement and rights. Because the focus on rights and privilege is a focus on self. Hard-hitting words in a South African context. And while rights are necessary in every society, it is equally important to remember our responsibilities. Jonathan Sachs kind of uses the same kind of language, and he says, rights are enshrined in law. Responsibilities are born in the moral imagination. And I love this word imagination because it's something that we all have. It's something that we can apply our minds to, what a moral imagination is, and that our responsibilities come out of this imagination. So they come out of how we think and how we see things, and we've got to be shaping, taking those thoughts captive. We've got to be developing our imagination for the gospel and what that means. So social covenant, which is what we're looking for, emphasizes moral responsibility in which the individual chooses to shift his focus from his own rights to the needs of other. Isn't that a, a story and a legacy and something we want to pull out in South Africa as we get off our knees as South Africa and start to stand again, start to rise above our past and the challenges that we've had that, but to take that on. And allow those things to shape us going forward, to lay a foundation for the next generation and the next. And as Christians, we need to recover the biblical concept of covenant and shift from the emphasis on rights and privilege to the responsibilities to God and to one another, which is exactly the passage that we've been reading about what we need to do. And so Jeremiah, in closing, gives us this kind of view of God's covenant towards us. And he says, But this is a covenant that I make with you and the house of Israel. And after those days, says Yahweh, I will put my law in their inwardmost parts, and in their hearts I will write it. And they will, I will be their God, and they will be my people. What an identity again. What an what a image bearer of God are we? We're created in his image to glorify him as he builds these inward things into us, the people of God. God's covenant with us is a covenant of the heart, a covenant of free people sharing God's love with others as they are willing to embrace the responsibility to love God and to love others. An amazing challenge and a provocation to us this morning as Joe Burgers, as we go about and live our lives in this great city. Won't you stand with me? Won't the band come up? And I want to sort of pray this prayer um, over you from Ephesians. And really, this is a prayer for Ephesus, the city of Ephesus and those who live in it. And I want to pray for Joburg and the Joe Burgers that live in this great city. So bow, with you, bow your heads for me, with me for a moment just as I pray this prayer over us. And it's from Ephesians. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom 
Every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. That's all of us. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with the power of his spirit in your innermost being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled, the, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine, according to his power that works, um, his power that is at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all the generations forever and ever. Amen.